for being here tonight. I uh, appreciate you coming out. I know Tuesday evening was hurt. I'll introduce myself. Hello, I am Michael McGee. I am the current president of GTFF, Graduate Teaching Fellows Federation. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, I want to give some brief context for tonight's discussion. As we've all seen in email after email and talk after talk uh, and university communique after communique, the university claims to be committed over these last few years to what they call academic, quote, excellence. Right? This is our, our esteemed President Shield's favorite catchphrase. Uh, however, it's, uh, there seems to be some contradictions, let's say. Uh, in UO's stated aims of achieving academic excellence and their actual practices financially uh, and also their troubling connections with certain uh, corporate entities. <laughs> the university uh, has increasingly been imposing a logic of fiscal austerity and corporate management on the university of Oregon, effectively transforming it ever so slowly but ever so surely into a for-profit <coughs> institution. All the while we hear talk of academic excellence University of Oregon is actively divesting from its central academic mission. Just this year, we are hearing over and over again that the University of Oregon is staring down the barrel of an $11 million deficit. A deficit which, in my view, is a result of their own budgetary mismanagement. Uh, just to give a few examples of this, uh, there is continued opulent spending on athletics. Every, every couple years, it seems, there's some new athletic center. Every game, there's a new jersey. Go on and on with that. Increasing spending on high level administrative salaries. All the while, uh, the university is insisting that they are in a financial crisis uh, and insisting on cuts to benefits and salaries of its hardworking employee groups. In fact, just this week, in fact, and maybe perhaps just today, Lurk, one of the sponsor groups of this talk, the Labor Education Research Center, was told by President Schill in an email that they must cut two thirds of their budget by next week. Corrupt. And their budget. As I'm sure you've all heard, GTFF is currently in contract negotiations with the university, which are ongoing, uh, <laughs> and uh, GTFF is being asked to make significant cuts to its health insurance, uh, significant cuts to university's coverage for fees, and very minor salary increases all at the same time. And all of these things are perhaps unsurprising, as I'm sure Josh will go into much more detail, given the university administration's deep ties to the Nike Corporation. Just to give a few examples, and again, I apologize for naming names, but I think it's worth doing. Uh, Jamie Moffat, the university's chief operations officer, sort of the head of their budget, the head of a whole bunch of things, uh, was the former, this is a very long title, uh, finance manager, executive senior associate athletic director for finance and administration of UO Athletics. So deep connections there. Missy Matella, the head of UO's uh, uh, employee labor relations, was a former lobbyist for Nike in Washington, DC. <laughs> Uh, and of course, the, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, there is deep ties personally, professionally, uh, and uh, economically between high-level administration at the university and Nike. SEIU is, of course, currently in negotiations with all the universities in the state. And they are also, we don't quite know yet what this will look like, but they will surely be asked to make similar sorts of heinous cuts and compromises to their contract. United Academics goes into contract bargaining next year. And we can only hope that the university will treat them with you know, some more respect than perhaps other groups. Um, so in this context, I think there is no better time to begin having a real conversation about the privatization of the University of Oregon. And again, it's very deep ties to Nike. So with this context in mind, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. His work has appeared in a whole host of publications including The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and the BBC, to name only three. Formerly a reporter for Reuters, his latest book, The University of Nike, built on this foundation of journalistic acumen and clear passion for muckraking on those whose greed and corruption threaten the very foundation of our public institutions. So assembled friends, allies, and colleagues, please join me in welcoming Joshua Hunt. So I'm going to tell you guys uh, uh, a little bit about my book tonight, but most of the reason I'm here is to tell you that things for you are going to get much, much worse 
if you don't fight very, very hard to stop that from happening. Uh, as I'm sure you know, and, and uh, if you don't, I hope I can drive that point home this evening, what's lost here will uh, not, not likely be gained back, uh, uh, whether you're talking about health care or wages or academic programs or, or what have you. I mean, uh, the, the University of Oregon and it's over the course of its uh, uh, relationship with Nike, uh, which is the topic of my book, The University of Nike, um, you know, it's been this sort of long, long slide uh, into that, well, that leads to the, the situation where we find ourselves today. Um, you know, speaking of uh, how do we end up with a university that, that has, uh, you know, it, it's, it's actually quite unique. I mean, there's this word corporatization, uh, applies to many, many universities uh, in America, and I talk about some of those other universities as well. But uh, the, the situation here at the University of Oregon is, is somewhat unique in that um, it's a rare place where you see a truly unholy mingling of, of public and private sector work going on. I mean, the professors who teach your classes are uh, effectively state employees, they're, they're public servants, they're, they're um, you know, the, the, this institution receives a, a good deal of public funding and it's meant to serve these, you know, long-standing traditions of, of higher education, uh, you know, going back centuries and then more recently, you know, in the post-World War II era, you know, higher education has served a big role in uh, creating upward social mobility and, and things like that. And all, all these great missions that the public research university has had for decades or centuries in some, uh, in some capacity are really threatened by this mingling of, you know, again, like I said, professors who are professors and administrators who are, who are state employees who are supposed to be looking after the needs of the institution and most especially the needs of the students are instead uh, taking advice from uh, people who work at Nike, uh, people who work at uh, other corporations aligned with Nike, and um, who certainly do not have your best interests at heart. I mean, at, at best, these people have Nike's shareholders' interests at heart, and even that's questionable at times. And, um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, uh, just recently a, a reporter from the New York Times named Kevin Draper called me up and wanted to talk to me about this latest scandal. Um, I'll have to spell it out which one I'm talking about because there's so many. Uh, but the latest Nike scandal is involving uh, this lawyer, Michael Avenatti, and these, um, these allegations uh, of uh, Nike basically corrupting the recruiting practice and, and paying paying players to go to the colleges where Nike wants them to play. And, um, and then because Michael Avenatti is in Donald Trump's orbit, of course, there's this insane Twilight Zone aspect to the story where Nike accuses him of uh, trying to blackmail them, which is, you know, very possibly true. Uh, but, you know, what I, told, uh, what I told Kevin Draper of the New York Times uh, when he called me up to ask about this was that uh, Michael Avenatti's first mistake was trying to shame a company that is utterly shameless. I mean, Nike is pretty open about the way that it does business, and, it, and it's always been very open about, you know, the way it violates rules and norms, ethical, moral, and uh, legal uh, occasionally uh, uh, when it comes to things, everything from recruiting to, you know, global labor practices and so on and so forth. And so, um, so it's really just the tip of the iceberg to have, um, to have, you know, to be on the other side of the bargaining table from someone who now works for the university closely aligned with Nike and formerly worked for Nike directly. Um, you know, it, it's equally insidious to, to be across the, the bargaining table um, or to be in the classroom with someone who has never worked for Nike but ultimately has Nike's interests at heart above yours for any number of reasons, maybe because 
you know, maybe because their, their boss has a very close relationship with, uh, with someone at Nike that they have to deal with a lot for their work, with, which, again, I want to suggest to you is totally abnormal, totally out of the ordinary. Um, you know, it, it's sort of like, I mean, I hate to compare it to what's going on in Washington, D.C., but um, you have to kind of stop and remind yourself occasionally that what's happening is not normal. It's not what's supposed to be happening. I would suggest that that's going to be a useful thing for you to do here on campus. Uh, you know, I, I had, when I came to the end of the process of reporting my book and I, uh, went to Tobin Klinger, then the communications director, no longer, um, then the communications director and, and outlined, you know, a whole raft of, of things that I document in my book, in my book that, that range from violations of uh, public records laws to, you know, all sorts of unethical behavior. His response was just to say basically, oh, that's normal. Everyone does that. Every college does that. This is how college works. You just don't understand. The whole premise of your book is wrong, yada, yada, yada. And um, so, again, I encourage you, and, and uh, I encouraged uh, uh, some University of Oregon journalism students uh, to do this when I had a, a Skype call with them some months back. I encourage you to, to remind yourself on a daily basis that this is not normal. It's not how things are supposed to be. Um, you know, the, the, I really cringe when I see how uh, a school with a, uh, a good journalism program has a generation of you know, aspiring sports journalists growing up being taught that uh, they can't interview a player without permission from uh, some PR guy first. They can't just uh, you know, show up to, uh, you know, they can't just, if, if, if some player is accused of some crime, they can't just show up and ask the guy about it. They have to you know, get permission or something, or, or they'll pull the credentials for the whole staff of the Emerald and they can't go to games anymore and stuff like this. I mean, it's insanity. It's pure insanity. And, and uh, by the way, speaking of cuts and speaking of uh, cuts that might be made as opposed to, you know, he uh, health care for, for uh, you know, uh, the workers who make the university what it is, one place they might start cutting back is in the PR department. Uh, this university has an insane number of PR and marketing and uh, communication staff. I mean, uh, more than 80 by my last count. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's more now. And, um, you know, make no mistake about what their job is. The, their public, the, the entire public relations industry was founded uh, on, on a single book written by a guy called Edward Bernays. The book, title of that book is not Public Relations. The title of that book is Propaganda. Uh, I'm not making this up. Uh, look it up, read the book. It describes to you exactly how the public relations industry works today. And um, I would argue that, uh, you know, of the very dangerous fiefdoms that have taken over at the University of Oregon, uh, in partly because you've had a, a rotating cast of university presidents until recently, um, you know, the, uh, a lot of the institutional power in, in recent years has come from the public relations department, the office of the general counsel, and, uh, and you know, a few, also a few uh, top uh, administrators. But that's very dangerous because these people are, are not concerned with the things that you're concerned with. They're not concerned with the things that your parents were concerned with when they were helping you decide where to go to college and how to pay for it. These people, the, the office of the general counsel is, is basically concerned with uh, not getting sued and, and winning lawsuits when they do get sued or getting uh, the cheapest possible payoffs, especially when they're sued. Uh, as they often are for um, bungling some uh, sexual assault investigation on campus. Um, that's what they're concerned with. They're also concerned with doing whatever they can to make sure that public records uh, are not available for public scrutiny. That's another thing that they do in the Office of the General Counsel. And those are, those are also things that, that the Public Relations and Communications Department here at the University of Oregon are also very concerned with. And more than that, they're in basically the same business that Nike is in, which is 
which is image management and, and uh, controlling what it is that you think about them, controlling, controlling the brand. Um, I want to talk just really briefly about the origins of the book and, and the, uh, the early days of this relationship with, with Nike. I basically came here as a freelance reporter for the New York Times looking into a story about these three basketball players who were accused of, of raping a, a fellow student. And I was curious why it seemed to have been covered up rather shamelessly uh, while the NCAA tournament play was happening. Uh, by the way, the coach, that, uh, the coach that was in charge of recruiting one of these players after he'd been uh, found to have committed a sexual assault at another institution, the coach who uh, allowed these three players to stay on the roster throughout NCAA tournament play while they had this rape investigation hanging over their head, the coach who did the same thing a few later with another player who is, uh, uh, you know, a big star uh, athlete here, uh, is the same coach that the Oregon Ducks men, men's basketball team has today and, and is apparently going to have for, I don't know, another seven or eight years or something now. Um, you know, that should shock you. That should be shocking to all of us. It's, it's, uh, this is a bit of an aside, but, you know, I find the the rhetoric around um, college athletics really uh, ugly and uh, really disingenuous. All this talk of, you know, coaches being like father figures to these uh, players and, and raising them to, uh, to do right and, and this, this and that, when in reality there's, there, you know, I mean, these sorts of things don't happen in, in a, and shouldn't happen in a household that's being run correctly or in an institution that's being run correctly. Um, but again, I digress. Uh, the, the origins of this relationship with, Ni with Nike and the University of Oregon basically go back to 1990 and this, this ballot measure five, which, which severely cut funding for higher education in Oregon, for all public education, but especially for higher education. It cut it dramatically and it cut it uh, really swiftly so that just a few years later when this guy Dave Fronmeyer, a former attorney general in Oregon, all around very powerful sort of guy in Oregon politics, when he, um, you'll, you'll know him if you've watched, uh, uh, what's the documentary about the Rajneeshi on Netflix, Wild Wild Country, you'll know Dave Fronmeyer from that, uh, if not from my book. But. Um, you know, when he becomes president of the University of Oregon in 1994, uh, he immediately decides that the school needs more outside funding and that that funding should come from a big corporate benefactor. And um, the confluence of, of him being there and having relationships with people like Phil Knight and, the, and, and then in 1995, the Oregon Ducks having this kind of fluke trip to the, to the Rose Bowl and deciding that, uh, you know, Fronmeyer and, and others making the decision that uh, the, the answer to the uh, budget crisis is to, you know, A, get, get money from uh, Phil Knight and B, use it to build up the athletics program as a means of attracting more out-of-state students who they can charge higher tuition. You know, basically a, a, a really short-sighted, really short-term solution. The problem is this is still the solution that, that you're dealing with today. I mean, uh, you know, by now you've got like 50 layers of bandages on a wound that's already bled out. I mean, it's, it's, it's really uh, very, very short-sighted, uh, remarkably short-sighted kind of thinking. But uh, at the time, it probably seemed uh, somewhat persuasive, you know, the, the classic argument of, why not let business come in and run things more efficiently, run them the way that, um, you know, let these business guys have a swing at it since we mucked it up, since the taxpayers don't want to pay for it. Uh, you know, the Nike guys can make some money and, you know, maybe their, their uh, innovative, brilliant ideas will save the university. Well, it turns out that's not the way, that's not the way it works when you let business guys run things, as we're now seeing in Washington, D.C., uh, because business guys, aren't really all that smarter than anyone else. Uh, they just are very, very focused on one narrow thing, which is making money. 
and bending every rule that they have to to make as much of it as they can, and sometimes even breaking the rules. And, um, and there's a good amount of rule breaking in my book, and there's um, even more rule bending. And, um, and so, uh, to get back to the, uh, the mid-1990s, the late 1990s, and the, the origins of this relationship between the University of Oregon and Nike, um, you know, this becomes an attractive, this partnership is an attractive proposition for Nike and for Phil Knight because it's precisely at this time that Nike's trying to make inroads into football. And so, you know, having uh, partnerships with college football teams is sort of a path to bigger deals with the NFL. And, um, and things go along pretty smoothly for uh, four or five years. Uh, Phil Knight gives, he, Phil Knight at this point uh, starts his, his, what becomes his kind of blueprint for, for, uh, for uh, working on projects at the University of Oregon. Uh, this is sort of uh, myth, myth number one, the, the big myth about billionaires and corporate benefactors in higher education is that they're coming in and saving the day with all their money. It's not true. What they do is what Phil Knight does, is they say, I want you to build a really nice $30 million building, and I'll pay for 12 million of it, or 15 million of it. And so what you get is, yes, you get a nice new athletics facility, which does help, uh, arguably, uh, helps the athletic folks uh, do a better job recruiting and maybe gets better caliber of players, and that maybe that does raise the profile of the sports teams, but you're also handing the school a bill for $15 million. Um, and by the way, the building's already named after somebody. And so now you've got to raise the other half of that money, um, and you've got to do it without being able to promise someone that you'll put their name on it. Uh, that, that's a really tough task. And so how do you do that? Well, uh, you know, Dave Frohnmeyer was a, a really, really talented uh, fundraiser. I mean, he had a nonprofit organization for years, and he unsuccessfully ran for governor in uh, the 89-90. And um, he was, at that time, he, he raised more money than any other gubernatorial candidate in the state of Oregon had. I mean, he had, uh, he had George Bush Sr. flying flying over to uh, host a, a fundraising breakfast for him. He, he was a very impressive fundraiser. And so he, you know, when we're back in the late 90s, when we were talking in the realm of tens of millions of dollars and, and mostly under $50 million, uh, Dave Frohnmeyer actually did a pretty good job of getting other local, you know, big business owner alumni types to kick in a million here, five million there. Um, but uh, eventually what happens is the projects get too big and too numerous, and that won't cut it. And Phil Knight's not gonna pay a dime more than he has to, because it's not really philanthropy for him. It's, I mean, aside from often being a tax write-off, it's basically an investment. Uh, and and, and um, so what happens then is the school has to go begging in the state legislature for, for the issuing of bonds which come with really high interest payments and I won't bore you with all the details but it's just it's just not a good, good system. I, I compare it to uh, basically the University of Oregon is a 15 year old with a credit card that has a very high limit and uh, you know Phil Knight sets the limit and Phil Knight tells you what you can and can't buy uh, but it's always stuff that is, that, that is way beyond your means. Uh, the, the University of Oregon has long been a school living well beyond its means. And meanwhile, while the school is funding the building of you know, more and more impressive athletics facilities and, and other types of building renovation projects and whole campuses now, which are you know, very impressive but very, uh, very much out of out of the, the realm of reality of, as far as what the university can actually afford. Meanwhile, they're constantly cutting back everything else and, and raising tuition as high as they possibly can because they have never, again, to get back to that myth of the billionaire savior, the corporate savior, 
All this money is just an investment for them. It's going into things associated with the athletics department and things that, that, direct, that directly uh, or indirectly benefit Nike, Phil Knight, whatever other corporate stakeholders there are. Um, you know, there's really not any interest in the quality of the institute, in improving the quality of the institution itself. And so what happens is the underlying problem has never been solved. Um, today, you're dealing with the same problem that the school was dealing with in 1991 and 92 and 93 as the, uh, this uh, disinvestment in higher education from, from taxpayers was, was really devastating the, the university. And um, the difference now is that uh, your generation is being, is not only facing a huge student uh, debt crisis, but is also being priced out of, of having a higher education at all. I mean, one of the truly shocking things to me is that looking at uh, the difference between how things were in, in the 1990s and the aughts and today, one difference today is, is that um, because they're still raising tuition and recruiting out of state and international students in greater and greater numbers in order to, to try and make up for the, the funding that they're losing from the state, the same really short-sighted solution. Uh, uh, one, one consequence of this is that some years, as you guys know, your tuition jumps so high that someone who is starting as a freshman this year and who can barely make it, someone who's uh, working full-time and with their job and their loans and their Pell Grant and their scholarships, they can sort of barely get by. Well, guess what? Uh, three years from now, they, they might have seen two or three big tuition hikes, big enough that they might not be able to graduate. And so they, then they end up with two or three years worth of student debt and no degree to show for it. And that's, what's, that's the story of what's really happening at the University of Oregon. I mean, that, that's, that's what everyone should know about your school and the role that it's playing in this national tragedy that is the student debt crisis. Um, uh, and it is, it, is, uh, it is really, truly a tragedy. Um, you know, underneath this image of um, uh, whatever the hell your slogan is now, uh, whatever, whatever Nike has uh, decided your slogan is now, underneath that is this, this really uh, stark reality. And, and by the way, it all, it, you know, from the beginning of this relationship with Nike, it always has been, it always has been the image that Nike creates for the university. I mean, one thing that I describe in my book is, um, you know, the people who were in charge of, the people who thought they were in charge of uh, the university's branding and its marketing were suddenly marched into uh, a meeting room one day and told, hey, meet these nice people from Nike who just rebranded the university. Here's, here's your new logo. Here's what our uniforms are going to look like from now on. I mean, the, you know, the University of Oregon, in terms of its brand, is entirely a, a creation of the Nike Corporation. And again, I'm going to argue that that's a really dangerous thing because Nike does not have your best interest at heart, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, Nike has one interest, and that interest is making money, making as much money as it possibly can, uh, making more money than it made in the previous quarter. That's the only thing that Nike cares about. Um, I'm going to also argue that, uh, you know, speaking of things getting much, much worse, um, well, first I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about, about things to be hopeful for because we've covered a lot of the really bad, scary stuff. Uh, on my book tour, a lot of people asked me, they said, this seems like a, this is, this is really fucked up. This is bad. <laughs> this is a very dark book. Uh, is there any, are we just screwed? Is there any solution on the horizon? And, um, you know, it was something I had to think really deeply about, because as a journalist, it's, you know, sometimes your job is, is more to just document what's happened. and you get tunnel vision, you don't really think about some of the, what some of the solutions might be. And um, as I was finishing the book and we waded into this bizarre 
you know, Trump world that we're now living in. Um, you know, some reasons for hope uh, started to present themselves. One, is, and they had, they had corollaries with, with my reporting and with my book, because in the book, I talk about uh, a lot about the, the, the labor unions and the, the, the campus protest movement of the late 1990s and the early aughts, um, as far as the sweatshops, Nike's use of sweatshop labor. This, Nike's use of sweatshop labor, labor, believe it or not, was once controversial. I, don't, I, I know we don't talk much, uh, we don't talk much or think too much as a society anymore about you know, people dying in other countries to make our cheap clothes. Um, but in the 1990s, this was a big deal. And it was uh, a real stain on Nike's reputation. Um, I went to give a talk at Google when I was on my book tour. I got invited to, Google, to, to talk at Google. And, and one of the things that I told them was, you know, in preparing my talk for Google, it occurred to me, I had been one of these people that always made fun of Google for their slogan, don't be evil. And then I remembered that they were founded in the late 1990s. And I thought, oh, I know exactly. I understand exactly why a company founded by a couple young tech idealists in the late 1990s might have a slogan, might feel the need to have a slogan, don't be evil. It's because of Nike. Nike was, I mean, I'm from Alaska. I, you know, I saw as a young child the, the Exxon Valdez oil spill unfolding on television. And, and uh, my perception of, of, of bad corporate behavior uh, at the time was still, you know, my perception was still that Nike was pretty much at the top of the heap when it came to bad corporate actors. And, um, and so this campus protest movement, which was really uh, the product of a lot of strong collaboration between different activist groups, human rights groups, and labor unions who not only organize protests on campus, but organize uh, fact-finding missions to um, some of these countries where Nike had its, its sweatshops going. Um, you know, they, they got results. They, they really did force Nike to, I mean, whatever improvements Nike's made to its supply chain have been solely because of the efforts of those activists and those labor unions. And so I saw while researching my, my book this really important role that, that labor unions have played, not just in the history of uh, the University of Oregon, but you know, at, other at other schools as well. And it's, it's because there's, there's power in, in collective bargaining. There's, there's, there's power in numbers. And it's basically the only thing that university administrators and presidents respond to aside from money is, um, you know, is being scared to death of really organized uh, efforts to, um, well, to advocate for students, for, for you know, the masses. And so, um, and so having seen that, uh, I want to suggest that there are reasons to be hopeful if you look at the, the Parkland shooting survivors, the, you know, uh, I mean, my, my generation, I think, sort of gave up on the, uh, on the gun control issue and sort of thought it was just a non-starter. Uh, and then here, all of a sudden, these 18 and 19-year-old kids uh, are out there forcing real change to happen by just banding together and organizing and making their voice heard and really scaring the shit out of the NRA. And, um, you know, I heard some very encouraging thing, things talking to uh, members of the different unions about union, union membership being headed in the right direction. And so I want to suggest that you have, you know, as far as your unions are concerned, you have a lot to fight for. And uh, I also want to suggest that uh, if you're not a member of any union, um, you have a lot invested in that fight just as a student. And uh, I want to suggest that by banding together and collaborating. I mean, my reporting shows that, that the, uh, whatever resistance there has been to this alliance between Nike and the University of Oregon has solely arisen from different groups working together, um, whether those are activist groups or labor unions or uh, even church groups uh, and things like this. And so, you know, when it comes time for that next tuition hike, 
when it comes time for uh, that, the, you know, them trying to take away your health benefits or slash your wages or whatever it is they're trying to take from you, just remember that you'll never get it back if you lose it. You will never, I mean, it, it's death by a thousand cuts and whatever they take away, you will never, ever, ever get back. That'll be the new normal and it's just rinse and repeat. It's the same thing. They'll, they'll, uh, uh, President Schill will go to the state legislature and beg them for more money so that they can help pay for this night campus for accelerating scientific impact. Uh, and then he'll turn right around and tell you that you have to pay more tuition because uh, the unions uh, are giving them a hard time and, and the unions, you know, want their members not to die of preventable diseases by having health insurance. Uh, that's not the case. Um, so I would suggest that, um, and you know, this happens, every, I mean, I think one of the tuition hikes I mentioned in my book that was especially severe, maybe it was 2016, they turned right around and blamed it on the unions. Oh, it's the, you know, the teachers asking for more money. That's, uh, it's like, well, what about that $500 million building that you're, that you're working on that no one really needs? And by the way, who knows what the fuck it's for? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Silicon Valley could, could do no better in terms of a name than, uh, 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 you know, Campus for Advancing Scientific Impact, whatever that means. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place a wager and, and say that this, uh, I mean, I don't even have to bet. They, they've said this, they've said as much. One of the few things they've said openly about this night campus for advancing scientific impact is that it's meant to improve ties between industry and uh, researchers. Uh, they said this openly in their own marketing materials and they say it as though it's a good thing. And so again, I remind you, do not try and shame the shameless. Um, they're telling you exactly what their aims are. What they're not telling you is who they're gonna be working with. Uh, my guess would be pharmaceutical companies and probably something in the realm of AI. But whatever happens, uh, I wanna suggest to you that it's gonna be really, really dangerous and that you need to uh, fight really hard for as, for as much transparency as you can possibly have on the issue because there are, for one thing, your school does not respect public record laws to begin with. Uh, for another thing, um, there are exemptions. There are certain exemptions that uh, schools can, that, well, that public institutions can have for keeping private, public, otherwise public records which might uh, reveal some trade secret. So, in the future, when uh, researchers over at the Knight campus are working with some pharmaceutical company on some drug and they're doing something very unethical that they should not be doing and they're talking about it in emails, when reporters like me are asking to look at the emails that are coming out of that campus, um, they're gonna get stonewalled by the Office of Public Records. The Office of Public Records is going to say, uh, oh, sorry, this is protected. We might reveal a trade secret. By the way, again, another cut, just fire everyone in the Office of Public Records. They, <laughs> they're, they're breaking the law. They're not, they're not doing what they're designed to do. Um, there needs to be some kind of reckoning, some kind of uh, ombudsman in charge of that or something. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous that uh, Oregonians do not have access to records that they, as the as public citizens, are supposed to to own. Uh, the university is only supposed to be the stewards of those records. They don't own those records. Um, and th by those records, I mean any email that Shill sends to someone. Uh, the records that they wouldn't give me or that they gave me that were entirely redacted, uh, which then set me on the course of of writing this book rather than just a newspaper article. The records that I asked for were uh, records that I knew would be utterly damning. You know, when I got here and I uh, realized that there had been a cover-up over this sexual assault investigation, I asked for the, the, the emails between the president and the head of the communications department and a few other top administrators on the, on the night and the day after the rape was reported and on the night and the day after the, the news of the rape was leaked. 
because I knew that once I saw those emails, I would see these, these guys saying some things that they really should not be saying and that would look very bad, you know. I, I, was, I was convinced that what I would not find is we need to look out for the victim here, we need to <laughs> follow the, the law. Follow. No, what, 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 what I would find would be, okay, here's how we cover this up, here's how we, uh, you know, here's how we make this look like we're doing the right thing and yada, 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 yada. And so, um, so that's one way in which the, I would suggest the, the night campus is something really dangerous to look out for on the horizon. Uh, the other thing to look out for with it, and, and uh, we'll maybe move to Q&A after this point, but the other thing to look out for with regards to the night campus is that um, it's, I mean, 500 million is an insane amount of money to raise. It's crazy. I don't see how the university could possibly do it. Legis state legislators are already getting fed up with Schill coming back to them with his cup in his hand saying, please give us some more uh, for this you know, ridiculous billion dollar uh, project, uh, especially after he you know, so publicly gloated about Knight's generosity and how it's the biggest gift that anyone's ever gotten, so on and so forth. You know, to celebrate like that and, and, and then turn around with cup in hand and go and ask the, the legislature for more high interest bonds to, um, to uh, you know, so that you can pay for something ridicul ridiculous like that is absurd. And I don't think it's gonna happen. I just don't see the legislature giving up that kind of money for something like that. Um, so I think it's gonna end badly. I mean, it's gonna end, uh, one way that it could end is that uh, uh, it just, the project just somehow collapses or, or has to be scaled down. Another way, a really frightening way that it might end is that they get close, is that they get within 200 million, 150 million. And then you have to start asking yourself, what would someone like Michael Schill do in order to make sure that the campus got built on his watch so he could move on to that next school, get, get that big pay raise and, and be the hero. Because that's the, that's the template for a university, pr a university president these days is very much like a college basketball coach with the exception that a college basketball coach is expected occasionally to perform. Um, <laughs> A university president moves from one school to the next. They show up. They try and build something really nice looking. They have their name associated with it as though it couldn't have been done without them. And then they go on to the next school. They move up a tier or maybe they move a little bit laterally and they take, but they get more money and they start the process over. I mean, frankly, again, Shill has been here a while by U of O standards, but, um, <laughs> but he's, Trust me, his eye is on the, the horizon, unless he and Knight have even bigger plans that we, that we don't know about. Um, but uh, uh, so with that, with uh, those words of caution and, um, and uh, my uh, imploring that you should all keep a very close watch on what goes on with the Knight campus, that you should be very skeptical when the administrators tell you that you that they need to cut teachers' salary, that they need to cut graduate students' uh, salary, that they need to cut health care. You know, ev all these little things that they tell you are just too much. Um, I, I would suggest it's not so. I would suggest that maybe look at the hundreds of millions of dollars that they're spent. You know, ask Michael Schill why he isn't going to the state legislature and begging for money to pay for health care for graduate, you know, student teachers. Ask Michael Schill why he isn't going to the state legislature and begging for any of the other things that would improve, that would markedly improve uh, the quality of life or the quality of education and the opportunities available to students and faculty and other kinds of workers here at, at, at the University of Oregon. Because, uh, you know, the, the community in Eugene really relies on the University of Oregon. It's a big employer of all different kinds of people and they should not have to pay the price, none of them should have to pay the price for the short-sightedness of a few top administrators and for the financial gain of one billionaire. 
And so with that, I'll take questions. Well, uh, you talked a lot about the uh, financial and the uh, effects you know, of Nike and of corporate funding, and only less than 10% of the money comes from the taxpayers anymore. But you didn't talk at all about the effect on the, on the uh, person in terms of what, what, is the, what is the nature of a human being? What is our conception of the person versus society or any of these kind of things? And so I think those are more, more insidious effects of, uh, of the corporate takeover of the university. I normally start these talks with the nature of a human being, uh, <laughs> but uh, tonight I opted to dive in uh, a, little, a little more narrowly. Um, no, I, I mean, it, 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 it's a good point, and there's, there's a chapter in my book that deals a bit with, uh, well, that deals a lot with the history of, of you know, what, an edu what, what, what a university is supposed to do, and, and specifically what a public university is supposed to do, because... Um, you know, there was a there was a long period of history where higher, where any kind of education, but especially a, a higher education, was a uh, either an aristocratic pursuit or a religious pursuit, and public universities really changed that. I mean, uh, uh, it's you you couldn't overstate the importance of. America's public universities and how they've contributed to civic life in all different kinds of way from, from like I said, from giving the impoverished a, a path to, um, you know, a path to social mobility. I mean, and, and in the past, in particular, you know, I mean, one thing I'm sure you guys are, you students are really hate hearing about is like how cheap, uh, you know, your parents or your uncle or whatever what their tuition was for Harvard or Yale or whatever, wherever they went, you know. I mean, it's absurd how expensive higher education um, has gotten. But, you know, for one example, I mean, Dave Fronmeier's, Dave Fronmeier, a uh, uh, Harvard-educated Rhodes Scholar, Oregon Attorney General, ex-University of Oregon President, you know, his dad was a German immigrant who, uh, who worked his way through uh, college at the University of Oregon and through the University of Oregon's uh, law school. Um, uh, as a, I f it's in my book. I forget what his job was. It was he was a waiter or something like that. It was it was some very um, working class type profession that he was able to to put himself uh, through college. And then you know within a generation, the the family's fortunes turn from you know immigrants uh, uh, with nothing to, you know, one of the most, his son becoming one of the most powerful people uh, of his generation in Oregon. Um, that's a really powerful story about the, the, the possibilities, um, you know, that, that, a, that a good public higher education can give you. And um, uh, anyway, so yes, I mean, the, the, the human costs are literally incalculable, um, but it's going to have a, a, a really, you know, bad effect. To use one example, if, if, if um, say, the Knight campus goes in the direction that it seems like it's going and humanities are kind of trampled on and all of a sudden you get nothing against STEM people, but you get all these STEM people in one building um, <laughs> and you have them working underneath people at corporations, that's a recipe for disaster. I mean, that's like a ultra neoliberal wet dream. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be terrible. It's really a recipe for just all the worst of human nature to to emerge. Uh, let's go way back. Yes, you. Well, well, we have roughly 230 people in the room who I'm kind of assuming are like mind or um, potentially would be. Um, Closed question, but a uh, guided question. What do you suggest we do next if we do not want that uh, dystopian sci fi future that's beckoning on the front door? Um, how do you, do you have suggestions? Again, it's a little bit above my pay grade, uh, <laughs> preventing dystopia, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just reiterate, you know. A, I'll just reiterate, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll reiterate that 
When I was writing the book, I was very focused on documenting what I thought was an important history and an important cautionary tale. I didn't really think about solutions or things like this or hope until I went out on the book tour and had people asking me questions about that. And, you know, I was surprising, I was surprised how encouraged I was. I was surprised how much hope I had, mostly because of, you know, I'm encouraged again, like I said, by the, the Parkland shooting survivors, these 18, 19 year old kids going out there and getting traction on an issue that seemed intractable um, and really making the NRA sweat. Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that we have, um, that we have mainstream politicians who are calling themselves democratic socialists who are out there. I mean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is like, every day I'm impressed by the, 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 the things that she gets people talking about that were just, I mean, like, you know, this, this, uh, this Green New Deal and all this, these, these are really, uh, you know, just, the, I mean, even mentioning socialism was just not anything that any Democrat or, or most liberals wanted to be associated with uh, a few years ago. And I don't call myself a socialist or anything like that, but I'm encouraged by the fact that our, there's, some would have you believe that, that, um, there's been this sort of narrowing of, the, of American public discourse and, oh, we're not allowed to say this or that anymore. Mostly it's like edge lords and like, you know, the sort of alt-right types who will tell you this sort of thing. Um, the occasional PSU professor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but really, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's an example of the way our discourse has opened up to ideas that just a few years ago were considered super radical and unworthy of discussion in a broad national forum. I, I mean, I think I, th I think uh, I think I saw Ocasio Cortez on the cover of Time or some magazine like that recently. That that's a huge deal that someone is building a really impressive political career uh, based around ideas that were considered toxic a few years ago in Washington, D.C. And it's really encouraging to me to see um, a generation of young people who, uh, whether, whether they call themselves socialists or not, who are, um, whatever they call themselves, it seems like there's a generation of young people who are really uh, concerned with uh, a political ideology that, that, that reckons with uh, labor and capital in ways that that we haven't been for a while. So, yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you received any feedback or reaction from the university after publishing the book. And the reason I'm asking is because I've heard rumors that they would not sell it on the campus. Oh, I'd be very surprised if they sold it on campus. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's a form of feedback. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't begrudge. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't put, uh, you know, their pamphlets in my home. So I don't, I don't expect, <laughs> I don't expect them to, uh, to sell my book on campus uh, per se. Uh, I'm sure plenty of good. Uh, you can go over to Tsunami Books and find it. <laughs> Uh, off campus, but uh, you know, I got uh, actually a much more tepid response than I expected. I, I thought they might have a little bit of fight, but they 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 gave a very kind of canned response that said, uh, "Oh, he's this guy's just dredging up ancient history and all this, you know, as though history isn't worth paying attention to." You imagine a university uh, saying that. that <laughs> Very recent history isn't worth paying attention to, and then insinuating that uh, uh, that maybe I had my facts wrong when most of my facts came from their own archives. I mean, pretty bold stuff. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, there's a Harvard Business School professor by the name of Clayton Christensen, mm -hmm. and he said that within the next 10 or 15 years, probably closer to 10, half of American universities are going to be bankrupt or going into bankruptcy. Before anybody thinks that's crazy, the president of Oklahoma, James Galagli, when he was brought in as president in July, said, I got a billion dollars worth of debt I can't pay. University of Cal has this crazy football stadium deal 
that's basically not going to be paid off for almost 100 years, and it's bleeding money from the rest of the university just to pay that football stadium. Mm -hmm. So my question is this. Isn't it past time maybe to start thinking about the universities in terms of you're going to be going bankrupt, you're going to be going into default. We have to start thinking in new ways of how we're going to educate people for the next few years because this system is gone. Another, uh, this leads me to another, uh, another kind of solution that I had to think about when, when I was on book tour and people were asking me about this. You know, it occurred to me, we have all these uh, big corporations that are turning universities into their own private fiefdoms, you know. Uh, Nike here at the U of O, uh, Washington has a uh, uh, deal with Amazon, um, you know, Berkeley has famously had its uh, deals with Novartis, the Swiss pharmaceutical company, and with uh, BP oil. Uh, Maryland is trying to do what Nike did here uh, uh, with Under Armour, where founded by Kevin Plank, an alumnus of, of Maryland. And it occurred to me, you know, if we've got all these all these uh, good and kind corporations wanting to give money to universities, uh, why don't we just start taxing them? Why don't we start... <laughs> why don't we start asking these huge, enormously profitable corporations that uh, some of which pay you know, little to no taxes, why don't we ask them to pay a little bit of taxes? Why don't we ask them to pay some taxes? And then why don't we put a big portion of those taxes towards the uh, state higher education system or the public education system generally in the state where that corporation is, is from. Or, or put it all into one big pot and, and distribute it among the states. I mean, I think that's the kind of idea that I, I, I might have uh, felt crazy even suggesting openly a few years ago. But again, I think, you know, some radical ideas are being suggested in Washington, D.C. today. I actually don't think that's such a radical idea. Uh, you know, I think that seems like common sense uh, to, to save something as valuable as our higher education system, um, which even if you think about it in the sort of ghoulish neoliberal terms that a lot of these uh, people uh, speak, even if you erase the human element, it's still, they're still massive drivers of the economy and of civil society and, and so forth. I mean, the benefits are incalculable. So that would be my solution if I had my druthers. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, so you talk a lot about the benefits that Nike has given to the university, but I don't still remember You know, Nike's gaining from turning your campus into a big commercial. I mean, uh, for one thing, this all started. Uh, this all started uh, before the internet was a thing. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. Um, so back in the late 1970s, there's this. This is relevant because there's this cheating scandal going on right now. So um, uh, you know, uh, people are outraged. Uh, they're, pay, they're paying off the players, they're getting around the recruiting rules. They've always done it. In the 1970s, late 70s and, and early 80s, they did it. They had this guy named Sonny Vaccaro who drove around to, to college campuses and he, uh, it was against NCAA rules back then. Uh, you couldn't uh, make a deal with a player to, to have them wear shoes. You couldn't make a deal with the school. So the loophole was this guy, Sonny Vaccaro, who worked for Nike, who was hired by Nike specifically to do this one job. He would drive his car around the country, go to, to college basketball coaches and say, I'll pay you 5,000, 10,000, whatever dollars it was a year. By the way, this was, a, a, this was like half of what a coach's salary was at the time on average. They, they were making pretty little money back then. Um, he would say, I'll pay you this much money and I'll give you, how many guys are on your team? Okay, I'll give you that many pairs of free shoes, and all you have to do is make sure that they wear them and that they don't wear any other shoes. And by the way, I can't, it's illegal for me to ask you to contractually guarantee that, so just, you know, blink twice or whatever if, if you agree. And then what do you know? Um, the guy who uh, has a promise of 
uh, who, the guy whose choice is, do I keep getting paid five or $10,000 a year and keep forcing my players to wear these Nike shoes or do I stop? He keeps on doing it. And so Nike's competitors started doing this. And by 1986, the, 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 what they called sneaker money, these, these bribes essentially, um, these backroom deals, had, had blown up from being worth five or $10,000 a pop to being worth up to $100,000 a pop. And university presidents were outraged because they weren't getting any money. <laughs> so the university presidents went to the NCAA and they said, look, the coaches are getting rich and we're getting nothing. And meanwhile, back then, believe it or not, schools paid for equipment. If they wanted Nike shoes or whatever kind of baseballs or basketball, they paid for all that stuff. Uh, so Nike totally transformed that and turned it on its head by uh, forcing the NCAA to change the rules so that companies like them could uh, make these all-school deals. The benefit of the all-school deal, aside from turning every player into a walking billboard, is that, um, is that so back then people went to shopping malls and they walked into a store called Foot Locker and that's where they bought their shoes. Or maybe they went to some department store. So, you know, it was uh, uh, Nike and Reebok and uh, Nike and Adidas and to, uh, to some extent Reebok were engaged in a really heated battle for the, the shoe market back then. And so it was a really big deal to, um, you know, how, uh, there was this heated battle over how much wall space they could get at those stores. So to, it was a very big deal to have your shoe and your t-shirt and your stuff be the only stuff that you could get at the duck store or at whatever, whatever store. And um, another thing I talk about in the book, uh, which also relates to this, is you're, you're creating a certain kind of brand loyalty that is really difficult to buy. Uh, one thing I talk about in the book is there was a time, it may surprise you to know, when it was not normal for your school to be either a Coke school or a Pepsi school. And I'm not talking about just your college, I'm talking about fucking third graders and fourth graders, you know, like there, there, there was a time when it was abnormal for a school to accept money from Coke or Pepsi to exclusively market Coke or Pepsi products to their third and fourth graders or whatever, or whatever other, all these other kinds of junk food that they're marketing. And, um, and there was this one guy who uh, set up a company who went around the country brokering deals between these poor school districts and the soda companies. And, the and his selling point was basically his daughter. He would say, you know, my daughter grew up drinking Coke because Coke was at her school and she doesn't even know what Pepsi is. And she's gonna be a Coke consumer for life. And so that's one thing, that's a, a less tangible benefit that Nike gets other than getting that floor space. Another thing that they get is in the context of the 1990s, uh, Nike, Nike had become the big player in college. Michael Jordan gets the credit for, for Nike becoming the big basketball shoe company. But Sonny Vaccaro laid the groundwork for that. Um, Sonny Vaccaro was the guy who got Nike shoes on the feet of a ton of college basketball players so that they were even a position, in a position to have Jordan be their first big uh, face as they tried to take over the NBA. And so they were doing something similar in the 1990s when they were cutting deals with schools like Oregon. They were doing a similar thing uh, with, with football. They were using college football uh, to make inroads to get um, you know, bigger, bigger deals with NFL teams and stuff like that. And it's very, very profitable because all you have to do is pay the school. There's no, the, the players can't get paid. Aside from, I mean, these scandals, throwing players 5,000, 10,000 bucks, that's nothing. That's nothing to own, uh, to essentially own a, a person's uh, likeness and everything associated with their, with their branding um, compared to what they have to pay professionals. Um, and so uh, that, by the way, is why uh, the NCAA will, will never allow for um, players to be paid because it, it's not, I mean, all these myths about, oh, it's the purity of the game or whatever, they're, they're all being paid, they're being paid under the table. The reason why they don't allow them to be paid legitimately is because then it would be legitimate. They would have agents, they would have representatives, they would have a union, they would get more money, they would be treated more fairly. 
and Nike would pay more. Uh, and, the N and the NCAA and the universities and every everyone else, they want those profits for themselves. They don't want those profits to go to the players. So those are some of the benefits. You talked a little bit earlier about the importance of the anti-sweatshop movement, the student anti-sweatshop movement in yeah. the 90s. Can you say a little bit about what exactly unfolded in that campaign and on campus here and how that, how that, what that accomplished? Yeah, so, um, uh, 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 this group called the Worker Rights Consortium, I mean, again, it's, it's amazing to think about people caring so deeply about sweatshops, but they did. Um, so Nike had a bunch of black guys in the media, um, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, uh, daytime, daytime TV uh, host, that there were, you know, the New York Times and Harper's Magazine and all these, all these uh, journalists and celebrities even were highlighting the fact that Nike was using really exploitative labor practices. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. <laughs> and uh, and um, and you know, it really, it really, it, it really made a difference. I mean, um, and it made a difference because the, the the conditions were so poor, and there were children so young and working in some of these factories. And uh, there were workers who died. And, um, you know, the effect of consistently documenting this on the part of the media and on the part of groups like the WRC, the Worker Rights Consortium, um, which sent uh, uh, fact finding, you know, which sent fact finders to the factories to actually see what the conditions were like and to interview the workers in these kind of shanty towns that sprung up around the factories where Nikes were made. Um, they pushed Nike to do a lot of things that they didn't want to do by, again, doing the fact-finding missions and then writing reports, bringing them back to the college campuses, and then organizing the student population. Uh, and, and again, it was, it was, the key was that it was just lots of different groups of stakeholders, labor unions, international human rights groups, local, I mean, I found examples of like, uh, communists working hand in hand with like old church ladies just because they were like both uh, morally committed to this cause and, and they both, you know, believed that people in other countries had a right to uh, work without dying, uh, without, you know, having a sewing machine explode in their face and kill them, which happened at a Nike factory in Vietnam. And Nike's contention, they're shocking, I mean, uh, if you, I'm sure somewhere on this campus you'll find Phil Knight's autobiography, Shoe Dog. Uh, well, the Shoe Dog, uh, what was his company's response when Vietnamese workers started dying in his factories? We don't make shoes. This was, these were, this was their actual defense. We don't make shoes. They, and, and they, they got away with this defense uh, for years, just saying like, oh, well, we just market, you know, we don't, it's uh, subcontractors that are in charge of those factories. We, we're not responsible for that. We don't know what goes on there. And, um, you know, but be, because of the consistent efforts of the WRC and the international media uh, to continue highlighting the abuses, um, that, you know, people called bullshit and that didn't fly. And so eventually Nike had to get more sophisticated and start calling PR people, uh, corporate responsibility managers, and things like that. Um, but uh, the, the WRC and the, the campus protest movement did not relent, and that's key. I mean, they, uh, they adapted to all of Nike's tactics, and they just, well, even more than adapting, they just keep doing what they were doing. I mean, I think that's an important takeaway, is that they didn't always get immediate results, but they just kept gathering, they kept sending fact-finding groups to these factories, interviewing people, coming back with stories, documenting the abuses as well as they could, and they kept getting them into the hands of the media and, and, and helping, pe and celebrities and spokespeople. And I mean, I mean nowadays, I mean, uh, 
with Twitter, stuff like, I mean, it's, it's very easy to, to name and shame these days, but um, back then it was hard work and these groups like the Worker Rights Consortium did it. And they did it in collaboration with lots of other groups and it was very, very effective. It made Nike, I found cases in Mexico where um, uh, at this one factory in Mexico, um, basically uh, the subcontractor, which was a, a Korean company, but they really effectively only existed because of Nike and, and either Reebok or Adidas. They made shoes for two, for two companies. And um, what happens is they would get a huge order from Nike. They would need to like work their, you know, they'd have to fill it. So they'd, they'd hire younger kids than they should have uh, hired. They would make people work unpaid overtime. They would um, not give that, they weren't following uh, even Mexican minimum wage laws. And um, uh, I think it was five or so women who worked at the factory like stood up for themselves and said, no, no more, we're, we're organizing. Their union had been corrupted. They were, uh, it was a state aligned union. And so the union just always sided with, with Nike or, or, or whatever footwear company it was. And, um, and so they created their own union. They, they created their own real union and they organized and Nike and the subcontract, subcontractor retaliated by having them fired. And it just outraged everyone else at the factory. And so they, they doubled down and there was a big strike and the WRC covered it in a really committed and really detailed way and produce these really high quality uh, in-depth reports. And eventually Nike, Nike was forced to actually hire back, uh, you know, they, they had to hire back these, these workers and, and undo some of the damage that they had done and agree to, eventually they had to uh, recognize this real union, this actual union, uh, because these workers um, weren't being represented. And so they, you know, they weren't being given it, so they took it they organized and they took it. And um, I think that's the, the, the big takeaway from that period of, of campus activism is just that it, it works. I think it can work probably even better today because of social media and because of how much easier it is for students at different schools to be connected and for different groups to be connected. And um, it was, you know, it melted my cynical heart a little bit to, <laughs> to read about, to, to recall a time when that kind of direct action was really effective. But the key, I think, is direct action. It can't all be social media. You need um, people really, really doing the work to, to uh, find out what's going on and to let people know. And again, to just uh, fight like hell because every inch that you lose will not be gained back. Yeah. <laughs> we probably have time for, I think, two more, depending on the length. Was, was there a hand over here earlier? There were five. Okay. Uh, raise your hands. Uh, yes. Um, in, in response to this fellow's question back here, Josh, I think one of the things that hasn't been brought up, uh, but why are they doing this? because I think in your book they say that the workers make the shoes for about a dollar fifty, and then how much does this pair of shoes cost? And everybody has to have those shoes. Yeah. And uh, so the money, uh, I mean, I think in monthly review I read that uh, the iPhone, I don't know, what is it sell for? $800 and it costs like $100 yeah. to have it made. So this is the money that's at stake. It's that, that goal, yeah, um, and I mean you can tell me the exact figures because I <laughs> well, I've forgotten them, but they're in there. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I mean it's true. It, it's a uh, again, corporations um, are designed to do one thing and one thing only, which is which is to to profit and. Um, specifically to profit more than the previous quarter or the previous year or whatever. It's this insatiable, unending demand for, for profit. And so, um, you know, uh, Phil Knight's uh, 
great business idea was just to, um, you know, sort of focus on uh, marketing that's, you know, very hollow at the end of the day and uh, marketing that's designed to tell you that you're wearing a luxury product, but in fact it's very cheaply made and uh, it's, it's very cheaply made by people whose lives are not, uh, whose lives and well-being are not valued by their employers. And um, so, yes, at the end of the day, Nike does it for the money. Phil Knight does it for the money. Uh, I think another thing is, you know, some other people, certain things in my book, certain incidents, people say, why would someone do something like that? T talking about certain specific examples of Phil Knight's ruthlessness. And um, I talked a bit with, uh, in New York, uh, at, a, at a book signing, I, I uh, was able to talk with Jim Keady, uh, longtime anti-Nike activist. And, um, you know, he, he thought there's, his point of view was that there's, which I think there's some truth to, was that there's a sort of competitiveness, this like male machismo, machismo thing that Phil Knight has going on. Uh, me, I, I think it's more just, uh, I think he's a bit like Trump in that I think there's a certain kind of guy who's just not used to being told no and who just doesn't like being told no and has just always gotten what he wants. And, um, and so when uh, it seems like he, so when he wants something, he, he goes after it and he finds a way to get it. And, and uh, you know, he really dislikes when people stand in the way of that, I think. Okay, one more question. I haven't touched this side of the room. Wow, so. All right. Throughout the whole process of researching, writing the book, and going on a book tour, I'm sure you've encountered people and ideas and facts that you never expected to come across. Did it give you any ideas for the direction of your next book-breaking adventure? <laughs> My next book is all about the illicit economy in uh, counterfeit goods, and especially fashion and luxury goods. That's, I'll take this opportunity to, opportunity to point out that these, these are not uh, real Adidas Yeezys. These are counterfeits <laughs> made, by, made by good, honest criminals in China and not, not, by, not by a big, bad corporation. Um, so uh, I already had in mind my, my next book. But, um, but uh, you know, it's one of, the jo one of the joys of book tour is, um, you know, a book is a, a hard thing to write. It's, it's not nearly as profitable as, as people imagine. And one of the real joys of it is um, engaging with people who are engaging or want to engage with your ideas. And um, one thing that's interesting to me is that it's a very different book for different people, you know. Uh, I mean... I get emails all the time from academics who are just concerned about what they see happening at their universities and who say, yes, thank you, you know, thank you for documenting this and talking about this. I, I was invited to a conference at UC Davis Law School that was a, a really inter interesting interdisciplinary conference focused on universities and branding, where, where it's just sort of look, trying to take a really objective look from legal points of views and some people from the humanities and some people from marketing, the marketing world and just looking at like the hollowness of this thing we call university uh, branding and excellence and all this sort of, th this one professor had a whole incredible uh, lecture on this term academic excellence. Uh, okay, I think unfortunately that has to be it. So please join me in thanking Josh Hunt.